In today's episode, we're going to install this 670cc Predator V-Twin engine in the back of this 1969 Renault 10. And if we're lucky, we'll actually get the engine running for the first time. Now, for those who are not familiar with the Renault 10, well, it's a rear engine car that was built in France, so installing the Predator engine in the back of this car ain't going to be that weird. Meh. We ain't building this car for fuel economy. We're building it to go as fast as possible. Now, do me a favor and click on the like button if you heard me say that on all my other projects. So theoretically, there should be something like 30,000 or more likes. Anyway, if fuel economy is your thing, don't worry. We'll, of course, provide that data. But ultimately, we're just having some fun by installing this large lawnmower engine in a car and somehow expecting it to go fast. And if going fast is your thing, I'm right there with you, except we're going to do it the hard way. So, no LS swap for this Renault, at least not yet. Hmm. Anyway, I just had to get that out of the way before we continue. You wouldn't believe how many messages I get telling me I'm doing it all wrong. Yep. Mm-hmm. I know. You see, we're just having some fun, and hopefully we'll learn a thing or two. So the 670cc engine that we're going to be using for this project is rated at 22 horsepower at 3600 RPM and 33 pounds-feet of torque at 2500 RPM, which is interesting. The 719cc Kubota D722 engine we used in the Saturn was actually rated for less power, and the Saturn did pretty good, all things considered. Anyway... The numbers for this Predator engine indicate it's a good starting point, and given the aftermarket supply of performance parts, I reckon we could squeeze a little bit more power out of it. Over here we have a genuine oil filter, which is very car-like, even though this is a lawnmower engine. And, this engine actually has an oil cooler, which is, um, well, cool. So the output shaft on this engine measures in at 1 inch, which is nice, and we'll get back to this in a minute. Over here on this side of the engine, we can see it's equipped with an electric starter, but unfortunately there's no pull starter on this engine, so I guess we're going to need a battery. So this is a very simple industrial type engine, and the output shaft is intended for radial loads or overhung loads. Unfortunately, this engine wasn't designed for thrust loading, and that's when the load is applied in this direction. And the reason I mention this is, if we were to construct an adapter to mate this engine to the Renault flywheel and clutch, well, that would be awesome. But the downside is, the engine would be subjected to thrust loads whenever the clutch was disengaged, and that would ultimately destroy the engine. So to answer the question why we don't bolt the engine directly to the Renault transmission, well, it's all about the thrust loads. So in the past we've had this problem, and the simplest solution is to use a go-kart or minibike type torque converter clutch with a belt. This arrangement is also known as a CVT, or Continuously Variable Transmission. So, long story short, we'll end up with a compound transmission. Now, some people don't like this setup because they feel the belt won't last a long time, and I can say from experience the belt will last a very long time. And I would venture to say it would easily last 10,000 or more miles. Now, the other argument I hear is, the belt will slip, and I reckon it may slip a little bit, but once again, we've used this method in the past, and the clutch, the belt, and the driven pulley don't get hot at all, and stay a few degrees above ambient after an hour or so of driving. As a matter of fact, this clutch arrangement's used on moped autos over in Europe, and it's very reliable. If you've never heard of a moped auto, well, it's a pretty cool car that uses a two-cylinder diesel engine and a similar clutch setup like this. You know, the other thing to consider is, this clutch is a Comet Magnum 44, and it ain't one of those cheap clutches you can get on the jungle site for a few dollars. Nope, this is an industrial heavy-duty clutch, so in a future episode, I'll explain this in more detail when I can better demonstrate how it works. Anyway, we modified this clutch slightly to accept a little pulley so that we can drive our 20-amp alternator. This method that we're using to drive the alternator is by far the cheapest solution available. So let's take a closer look at the engine bay on this Renault and see what we're dealing with. Yep, there's the bell housing and we'll need to fabricate an adapter plate for that. Meh, no big deal. And over here we have a motor mount and on the opposite side we have another motor mount and those will come in handy for sure. Let's take a better look at that transmission. This thingy here is called the input shaft, and basically it takes the power from the engine and transfers it to the transmission. Now this Renault ain't exactly a robust car, and this shaft has quite a bit of play in it. But that's no big deal, because when the proper engine's installed in this car, it'll hold the shaft in perfect alignment via the pilot bearing on the engine's crankshaft. So we'll have to duplicate that arrangement on our shaft adapter. 
Now, just for fun, let's get rid of the bell housing via the magic of video editing and have a better look at that input shaft. Yep, she's a bit wiggly, and here's a better look. So it looks bad, and it might be, but our custom shaft adapter will eliminate 100% of this slop, so I'm not really worried. In order to fabricate the bell housing adapter, well, I went on YouTube and watched a few videos by a small independent channel called Robot Cantina. And you know what? I learned how to fabricate the bell housing adapter by watching this video here. I gotta tell you, the guy that runs that channel is a pretty fart smeller. Anyway, I recommend you watch that episode if you want to learn how to build a custom bell housing adapter. I'll put a link in the description. So this is what I was able to come up with. It's a perfect template that I can use to transfer every bolt hole onto a chunk of steel. And, as you can see on the back side, each one of these 3D printed nubs will actually slide right into the bell housing perfectly, thus providing a very accurate template. Not too shabby! And as you can see, the 3D printed nubs line up with the holes on the bell housing perfectly. So with this template, I went ahead and cut the quarter inch steel plate to size, and then drilled each hole in the exact location to produce this one-of-a-kind Predator engine to Renault transmission adapter. Fast forward a bit, and somehow I managed to make all the additional parts to support the engine. So let me assemble all this stuff, and we'll see if it'll actually work. So to assemble all this, I went ahead and mounted the bell housing adapter to an engine stand and started bolting all the parts together. Now, normally I would weld all these parts together, but this time around, I wanted to see if something like this could be bolted together. You know, bolting it together leaves a lot of room for changes or modifications, especially since this is the first Renault 10 in the world that's receiving a 670cc Predator engine transplant. Now over here is where I engineered the engine cradle to hold a 20 amp alternator via some custom brackets. Not too bad. You know, for the most part, we really don't need an alternator because this engine has a magneto ignition system and it doesn't require power from the 12 volt battery. And the only thing that's going to consume power are the turn signals, brake lights, and of course the starter. I reckon a decent battery would last a few weeks before it would need to be charged, but we're adding an alternator because it's probably the right thing to do. Now on this side of the cradle, we have yet another custom bracket that mates the engine cradle to the original motor mounts that the factory installed in this Renault back in 1969. Now in theory, this pile of parts should bolt right up to the Renault and provide a stable mounting base for the V-twin engine. Whoops, looks like we got ahead of ourselves and I haven't discussed all the rotating stuff. Alright, well, let's do that. So this thingy is a go-kart axle hub that we're repurposing and now it's the drive hub for our transmission. This aluminum part is a custom made spacer that links the drive hub to a stripped down clutch hub that came with the Renault. And of course this is the stripped down clutch hub. So for clarity, this was part of the clutch disc and we removed all the extra stuff because all we really need is the hub section with the splines that mesh with the input shaft on the transmission. And this is a 3 quarter inch shaft that we're going to use to both extend the input shaft on the transmission and it's also the shaft that the driven pulley mounts to. And here you can see we bored out the center of this shaft so it'll slide over the tip of the transmission input shaft. Now since all these parts are locked together to form a solid assembly, we don't need to use a bronze pilot bushing because, well, everything's locked together. So as you can see, the center of the spacer has been bored out and that's to allow the clutch hub to drop into the spacer perfectly centered. And then we'll use the 7 16 bolts to firmly secure the hub to the spacer. Now on the other side of the spacer, we machined a slight protrusion and that allows the drive hub to attach to the spacer perfectly centered. And it bolts together like so. And now we can slide the extension shaft into the hub. Of course here we show it being assembled without a key, but eventually when this stuff gets assembled permanently, the extension shaft and the hub will be keyed together. Fast forward a bit and you can see how the drive hub slides right into the main support bearing. Now, keep in mind, all this stuff is loosely assembled for demonstration purposes. When everything's tightened up, well, this assembly should be solid as a rock. Anyway, the main support bearing is what's known as a self-aligning bearing, and that won't work for our application. You see, this bearing is free to pivot within the flange. Now, it takes some effort to pivot the bearing, but it will pivot, and that introduces a big problem and will cause severe shaft misalignment. So we're going to use this second smaller bearing to hold the larger drive hub bearing into place. It all makes sense when it's put together. So for final assembly, everything has to get a generous coating of Loctite. The combination of the fasteners and the Loctite will eliminate any slop and will guarantee nothing will fall apart. 
Now, while I assemble this contraption, keep in mind we're using grade 8 fasteners and plenty of Loctite. Now, due to the torque converter type clutch we're using, none of these components will be subjected to shock loading. As a matter of fact, this is more or less the same basic configuration that we used in the past, and it should hold up fine. Now, given the amount of Loctite I'm using, it'll take a torch to disassemble all these parts once the Loctite sets. And how do I know that? Well, like I said, this is the same basic configuration we've used in the past, and once assembled, it doesn't come apart very easily without a hammer and a torch. And now you can see the final product. Here you can see how the two bearings are mounted in series, and that'll cancel the self-alignment pivoting that's inherent to these bearings. I guess I should mention that off-camera, all of these parts were adjusted for perfect alignment and spacing many times before we did the final assembly. Let's put the driven pulley in place so you can get a better idea how it all fits together. And there we go. For the YouTube audience, this only took a few minutes, but the way things work in real life, well, the Loctite's been curing for a couple of days now. Alright, so here's a better look at the completed Predator V-Twin conversion before we install it in the car. Keep in mind the engine's not bolted to the mounting plate, so if it looks a bit off, well, that's because there ain't any bolts holding it in place. Anyway, this should give you an idea how it all fits together. I reckon we should put this in the car and see what we can see. So here we have the completed engine mount platform installed and completely bolted into position. This thing is a bit on the heavy side, and we ended up having to use the engine hoist to hold it in place to get everything to line up. Now we didn't show it, but the bell housing adapter plate is lined up with the bell housing using dowels. So basically with the dowels in place, everything is perfectly aligned as it should be. I think now we're ready to drop the engine in and see if we can get it running. Well, there she is. Of course, it's only sitting on the platform, but it seems like it fits pretty good. Hopefully, you folks are getting excited and we'll have it running in a few moments. Stand by for the next scene. Off camera, I went ahead and bolted the engine to the platform, and I also installed the drive belts for the torque converter and the alternator. Now on the back side of the engine, I installed the muffler that came with this engine. Now I suspect this muffler will be a bottleneck of sorts, and probably will be robbing us of some power. Well, not to worry, we have the parts in stock to build a custom set of headers, but before we start modifying the engine, we gotta get this car back on the road and get some baseline data. Anyway, over here you can see I temporarily installed the throttle, the choke, the ignition switch, and all the other garbage that came with this engine. Meh, this stuff is more or less junk, but today we'll use it so we can get this engine running. Now off camera, I also filled the engine up with plenty of oil, and I refilled the transmission with gear oil. The only thing we need right now is gasoline, and the engine should start right up. But before we set up the temporary fuel system, I want to crank the engine over and prime the oil pump and possibly build up some oil pressure. So let's just crank it over for a few seconds. Nice. I reckon it's time to get this 670cc Predator V-Twin BIG BIGGER BLOCK started. And I'll be right back. Off camera I rigged up a temporary fuel tank and filled it with an ample supply of gasoline. Let's see if this thing will run. Uh, we'll give it some choke. Whoop, she fired. There we go. Keep in mind, this is the first time this engine's ever been started. The alternator's spinning, but it ain't hooked to anything. <laughs> and yep, we even put a proper tailpipe on it. Of course, this entire exhaust system is temporary and will eventually fabricate a new exhaust, as well as rejetting the carburetor. I think between the two mods, we can pick up some extra horsepower. Eh, this should be interesting. 
So far, not too shabby. I'll let this thing run for about 20 minutes to warm everything up. We can check for oil leaks on both the engine and the transmission. Well, so far everything's looking good. Let's pop that transmission into gear and see how the clutch works. And the axle's spinning. And I believe it's rotating in the correct direction. Now French cars are notorious for being weird and they're also known to be very comfortable. I have to say I'm excited to take this car out for its first road test, but obviously we ain't ready to drive this car yet. I still need to connect a bunch of stuff, but for the most part we've done the hard part. Now how fast will this car go with a completely stock 670cc Predator engine? Well that's hard to say, and if you're interested in knowing that, please consider subscribing if you haven't done so already. Now today we put a silly Predator engine in the back of a vintage Renault, but someday when this channel gets enough subscribers, we may be able to do more interesting cars, like perhaps a Porsche? I think a Porsche would be epic because it would likely upset a lot of people when they find out a Harbor Freight engine performs better than whatever the factory put in those cars. Hmm. So a package arrived at our P.O. box a few weeks ago, and I completely forgot about it. Well, better late than never. This package is from Tim over at the EcoModders website. If fuel economy is your thing, then that's the website to go to. It has it all. Of course, I'm a rebel, and I somehow build fuel-efficient cars, even when I don't intend to. Uh, oh, it's a t-shirt. Nice. Let's see if there's a note. Mmm, nothing. Well, Tim, I appreciate the t-shirt. Let's see what it says on the t-shirt. Well, it says EcoModders. Now, more importantly, let's see what size it is. Oh, that's good. 3XL. You can't go wrong with that. Otherwise... That guy in a little coat. That guy in a little coat. Oh, it says something on the back. Wrench smart, drive smart, save fuel. Well, with the Saturn project, we definitely haven't burned a single drop of gasoline since we put the diesel engine in it. So, I guess I'm doing something right. Thanks, Tim, for the t-shirt. Well, we still have a lot of stuff to do to get this car back on the road, so I'm going to get started on that right now, so we'll have another video up as soon as possible. Until next time.